Exactly. 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 Yeah. At first, some members of the neuroscience community scoffed at Ramachandran's new theory that neural pathways in the brain can change. One of the dogmas in neurology has always been that connections are laid down in the fetus in an early infancy. And once these connections are laid down, there's nothing you can do to change them. As a scientist, Ramachandran knew that such a radical proposal needed scientific proof. It was time to give Derek a brain scan. Hopefully, this would show what was actually going on in his brain. But would it prove that Ramachandran's hunch was correct? When various parts of Derek's body were wired up, the corresponding activity in his brain revealed the layout of his body map. This is a scan of Derek's brain. The green spot shows the brain's response to the stimulation of Derek's existing right hand. Next to it, the red spot shows that the right side of Derek's face is also being stimulated. So far, everything is normal. But in the right hemisphere, the green spot has disappeared because Derek's missing left arm can no longer send signals to his brain. Remarkably, the red area, which corresponds to his left cheek, has now taken over the whole space. These results vindicated Ramachandran's detective work. It's as though now the sensory input from the face is innervating a completely new part of the brain. And this means new pathways have been opened up. Whether this is because there's been an actual sprouting of new nerve fibers, or there have been pre-existing silent pathways, which are now suddenly active, we're still working on. We suggested that maybe the connections are already there, like reserved troops ready to be called into action. And when you amputate the hand, these latent connections suddenly become active. Phantom sensations do not only occur in the limbs. But in fact, you can get a phantom with almost any part of the body. You can get phantom menstrual cramps after hysterectomy. You can get phantom appendix pain even after the appendix has been removed. Theoretically, you could have a phantom of almost any part of the body, except, of course, the brain. You can't have a phantom brain by definition, because that's where we think it's all happening. Luckily for Derek, his phantom pain has subsided. But that's not always the case. James Peacock has suffered excruciating pain since he lost his hand six years ago. A few days after I woke up, you know, it might have been a week to uh, eight or nine days, something like that, before the pain really started getting bad, you know, to where it was like your hand is just crunched up real tight and stuff or balled up, you know, and you can't move it. It's unclenched. It's just, you can't. You've tried in your mind. This raises a perplexing clinical problem. How do you treat pain in a body part that's missing? James tried everything, from painkillers to hypnotism, but nothing worked. Until I found out about the mirror box. It was then that he came to see Ramachandran. And one answer might be that the brain is sending signals to the arm uh, and trying to clench it. But in you and me, uh, there's messages going back from the muscles of the hand telling you you're clenching too much or too fast. And this damps the, the command signals so you can, you can slow down. But the patient has no feedback because he doesn't have an arm. So the brain says, send even more signals, okay? And this goes on, and you get into a sort of positive feedback loop. So I said, well, if you give him some, some other source of feedback, such as visual feedback, maybe that'll trick the brain into thinking that the hand is clenching or unclenching, and maybe you can interrupt this loop. So I said, well, why don't we put a mirror there and have James look inside the mirror? It's just as though you have visually resurrected the phantom limb. And of course, the patient knows it's an illusion, but it's very, very compelling. Right now, as you look in there and you move your hand, your phantom does the same thing as your left hand is doing. First time I got in here and I've done this, and it was just like, it relieved the phantom pain, unclenched it. You know, it was just, oh, so intriguing, you know. You, sometimes it's just it's hard to explain how you felt, you know. Ramachandran believes the mirror box needs to be evaluated with many patients before he can be sure that it really works. 
but its undeniable success in uncramping James's phantom hand suggests that even pain can be a construct of the mind. The phenomenon of phantom limbs reveals how our brains can delude us into being conscious of something that isn't there. But Ramachandran has come across an even stranger condition, a remarkable ability of the brain that allows you to see even though you are totally blind. This rare condition is called blindsight. Ramachandran found Graham Young in Oxford, England. He is one of the world's few known blindsight patients. This paradoxical condition shows just how much our brains run our lives without our being aware of it. Well, when I, when I was eight, when I had the accident, it was the road accident that, that caused the brain damage, um, I literally used to walk into lampers. Um, I ran into, you know, these huge great pillars you, you get in stations? I ran into one of those one day. The main visual centers in humans occupy nearly half the brain in a large region towards the back of the head. Graham's vision was devastated by the accident. Today, he can see to the left, but is blind to everything on the right in both eyes. If you put an object in that part of the field and ask him what is it, he has no idea. He cannot perceive it consciously. And yet the remarkable thing is, if you move this object, he will tell you which direction it's moving, even though he cannot see the object. You can see things over here. Oh, yes, I can see. I'm going to move my hand across. You tell me when it appears, when, you, when it, it comes into view. Now. Very precisely uh, as it enters the seeing part of your field. Yeah. And if I just hold over here and you look there, you can't see anything? No. How about now? You're moving it up and down. But you're seeing it. It's very easy for me to say to you, oh, I saw that. Move up, Colin. Yeah. And as soon as I, I say that, you're going to say, ah, he can see. No, I can't. A hypothesis. Colin Blakemore is an Oxford scientist for whom Graham's mysterious abilities raise intriguing questions about consciousness. I mean, blindsight is extraordinary when you, you see it. It's shocking. I think it's shocking because it brings home the fact that we can actually manage our brains without consciousness to some extent. And that leads to the question, well then... Why not everything? Why not everything? And why do we need consciousness for certain things? What is the extra gloss that consciousness gives, if anything, to our actions? Right. I'm aware of individual functions of sight. Sometimes I'm aware of a motion. But that motion has no shape, no colour, no depth, no form, no contrast. Sometimes I can tell you what orientation it's at, but then we lose everything else. So what you like is the ability to put it all together to and to recognise an object, a thing, yeah. something with meaning. Mm. Well, blindsight is this term introduced by Larry Weisskrantz to describe the ability of people like Graham to detect things but not to be aware of them. So very, very different from what we would normally call vision. Right. If there's one thing that this phenomenon of blind sight teaches us, it is that vision is not entirely seeing. That there can be a disconnection from the capacity to respond to visual information uh, and the actual act of being visually aware of something. Those two things can be separated and probably are in our everyday lives. But the problem is that obviously we're not aware of the things that we're not aware of. We just don't know the extent to which they play a part. It's almost as if the patient is using ESP. He can see and yet cannot see. So it's a paradox. It's almost like science fiction. How is this possible? Well, if you look at the anatomy, you can begin to explain this curious syndrome. It turns out from the eyeball to the higher centers in the brain where you interpret the visual image, there's not just one pathway, there are two separate pathways which subserve different aspects of vision. One of these pathways is the evolutionarily new pathway, the more sophisticated pathway if you like, that goes